This meeting is being streamed. Hey, James, I am you? muted. There we go. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you now. Can you hear me? I know how this stuff works. Yes, I do. <laughs> yep, I got you guys. Hey, Corey. Hey, Jeff. So, what, uh, Morris. Moving over. 
That I can barely hear you. Okay. okay. Sounds good. Are you seeing any video? Uh, yes. Yeah, I've got the wide shot of the room. Am I getting smaller? I'm not getting to the monitor, the preview. No, I'm not getting it on the preview. Uh, one of the splitters was actually unplugged. So I was getting absolutely nothing on the monitor to start with. So. <clears throat> Maybe we can. Uh, I mean, you can have uh, enough for every. Yeah, yeah. Turn yeah. Re 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 the DAs off and on again. Also, yeah, I, I re re uh, power cycled all the splitters and everything. I'm going to restart the camera. Okay. So. I think I, I got. I'm uh, getting the stream going right now. So we got all the reports in. Jim was really good. Nice to see you, Corey. I just ignored your emails. <laughs> well, we get to that point, don't we? Yeah, he did. I know he did. He's a little busy, isn't he? Yeah. He said, "I just assumed that it was all taken care of. I didn't need anything." He said, "Well, there you when go. I say specifically your name and email, it means that I'm talking to you." Tim. <laughs> I unplugged the you camera, shoot off an email plugged it back in, and, and it's not powering on. on. Yeah. The camera is not powering back up? Nope. It is not powering back up. Did it power up the first time? Or did it get yeah. First I was, it was sending video, but I wasn't getting any on the preview oh, monitor. Okay, let's, uh, do we need to re about 20 minutes. He hasn't tried very hard to reach out to me. Okay. I've tried. Yeah. Well, my hair is been Can we try it one more time? With the camera. I reboot. Yeah. No. Or I could go ahead and kick. Uh, St. George. Kick the yeah, Kodak reboot. Yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. That's, that's, that's the one I talked to. I talked to him for about five minutes and I said, let me help you with this bill. Yeah. Because I want him to come up with something. Maybe, so I've, maybe. I've tried to get a hold through his in. Yeah, I've got it back now, Tim. I'm looking so, at it. Finally, he's still not going to say research tomorrow. Yeah, I, I am able to see it, so maybe we can just keep the camera one on a wide shot. Yeah, but I, but I told Where'd you stay at, Brent? Say again? Where'd you stay at? Uh, there's a new uh, spring home suite. Yeah, see the zoom in to the, the head table. So it's about 12 minutes away. So. Um, I guess what you could do is the live stream is up, and even though it'll be a couple seconds delayed, you could monitor it that way. 
Well, I think he's misguided too because I think he thinks that they're accessing through uh, school hardware. And, and I, think, I think they're using their smartphones. Well, I <coughs> you know, if they're going to want to have access, they're not going to risk getting caught using, well, a district equipment. And, and some are smart enough to do district equipment and even do that, but uh, that's not the norm. Yeah, you're right. How are you? Good, thanks. Good, you made it. Yeah. Traffic was okay. Traffic was great, actually. Okay. Um, I am seeing your click share right now as well. Good morning. You're seeing mine today? Good morning. 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 So white and flashing means we, it looks like we still need to launch the application and, and get yeah, the driver just, loaded on your machine. Yeah, I hadn't yeah, we need to have a solid white light. So go to your finder. Uh, right down the far left. Wow. This is the install, isn't it? I've already done no, that. So. Uh, that's uh, the app. So you have to right. use the app that's on the yeah, dongle. Got it. That way it that one sinks. Okay, I am seeing somebody's desktop there, a beautiful island that I want to go scuba diving off of. <laughs> yeah, that's Catalina. All right. Oh, that is Catalina, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. One of them. Okay. When you're ready. Right. Okay. Saw that? Oh, look great, guys. All right, we'll do. Hey, Tim, is uh, anybody else uh, doing a presentation? Has Ray maybe got one ready to go we can check out, too? Ray's going to be doing I'll be doing something, but I can't see the icon anywhere. Okay, so we'll go ahead. Just minimize. It's amazing to see that over time. I don't have any Oh, what? All the browns? Yeah. Oh, well, um, we needed to have them printed in our Bowling Green office. And um, it was a lot. I mean, they, they sent them to the little meeting yesterday, and I picked them up there and then just checked them out. All right, I am seeing a desktop of the desert scene and a small thumbnail of Ray Timothy in the lower left corner. Yeah, yes. So that's. Already uh, yeah, so, uh, 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 okay, Tim, if we could real quick when you get a chance, let's uh, turn all the mics off. I'm not sure if I'm still hearing ceiling mics or a podium mic, maybe. Um, we've got the podium mic plugged in because he's going to be presenting from the oh, podium. Oh, okay. So, yeah. I think it has more meaning. At Absolutely. Parts, uh, I do. Okay. I just wanted to go. Uh, and camera two and three are working okay for you, right? You see those on your preview? Yeah, yeah, I see those just fine. Um, I'm going to go power cycle the splitters again real quick. And see okay. Hey, James, can you hear me okay? Uh, yeah, uh, pretty good. Can you email Jim the voice dial-in? He wants to dial in via voice, but he wasn't seeing the phone number dial-in. In uh, so the, the phone number, phone number, or the passcode? 
Uh, I think probably we ought to do a phone number and passcode just so we have. Okay, so it's just it's just our 800 number, remember, and option four. Okay. And let me get you the dial-in passcode here. Or would you, what, did you say you want me to email him that? Yeah, and I got my email up now. I can... Uh... Okay. Uh, let me get you the number. It is 302. So, yeah, just have him call the 800 number. Uh, select option 4, 302 pound, and that should latch him in. Okay. Thank you. you that. You got the preview for camera one going? Yep. Awesome. Awesome. Love it when a plan comes together. Okay, the live stream is going. Uh, we are streaming and recording. I'm going to step away and mute for just a sec. I'm going to test the audio dial-in. Audio test one, two, three, four, five, testing audio dialing. Yeah, here I am. All right, thank you. Thank you. Well, and our, our next step is how to get it so we're not overcrowding the bandwidth in the home. Okay, Tim, I think we're ready to go. Anything else you need to check out in the room there? Uh, no, I think we're good. This is. Okay, cool. Thank you, sir. like uh, Mr. Stewart has joined us over the phone. Uh, Jim, can you hear us okay? Yes, I'm clear. Okay, great. Thank you, sir.
Uh, good morning. It looks like we had Laura Busby uh, join us from UVU. Laura, can you see and hear us okay? Yes, I can. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much.
Okay, if I could get your attention, please. That's right. Need a gavel. Well, welcome. Um, so, lesson learned. Uh, I have missed my uh, last board meeting uh, because the last time I missed, I found out afterwards that I would be sitting in this chair. So. <laughs> I guarantee you I will no longer miss any. Um, I, I just wanted just at the beginning of this meeting to thank uh, the board for um, your uh, faith and confidence in my abilities and wanted to let you know that it will be my pleasure and uh, honor to uh, uh, serve in this role. So thank you uh, very much for this uh, opportunity, I believe, in this organization. And uh, it's been my pleasure to serve on the board now for quite a while and uh, uh, such a great uh, opportunity. So thank you very much and looking forward to working uh, with uh, you all uh, more and serving in this capacity. So thank you. I just don't know what you did your finger. So um, I'm telling people shark bite because that sounds really <laughs> cool. Uh, that is a much better story than uh, saying that on January 1st I became a statistic, one of those guys that does something with a snowblower that you're not supposed to do. <laughs> yeah, I've raised five kids with this 20-year-old snowblower telling them all what not to do for 20 years, and I did exactly what I've taught them not to do. So. Did they move out? Exactly. The good news is my personal hygiene has become easier. It's one less fingernail I have to clip from now, now, now on. So anyway, uh, we have some introductions this morning. First of all, it's uh, my uh, pleasure to announce that, uh, that, that uh, Commissioner David Wollstenhume has uh, made an appointment to uh, replace Ray uh, Walker, uh, who uh, served on one of our um, higher ed, served in one of our higher education uh, seats here on uh, the board, and we have the uh, IVC Laura B, who uh, has been appointed by uh, Commissioner Wollstone Hume to serve in that role. Laura uh, is at Utah Valley University. She is the director of academic IT and analytics there at. Um, UVU. It's also been my pleasure to work with Laura uh, 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 in a number of different roles. I've learned to uh, very much appreciate her and respect her uh, professionalism and expertise. So 
Um, Laura, welcome to the board. Thank you very much. Great. Um, next in next introduction is uh, I'd like to introduce Matt McCullough, uh, who uh, has been recently hired to uh, lead uh, telehealth serve services with um, UT and Matt, would you please stand and introduce yourself, please? If you, we could get you close to a mic. Okay, well, thank you. I'm uh, very excited to be here. Um, just sitting here watching everybody come in, I thought uh, how grateful I am that in my career I've been able to serve with I, what I think are some of the giants in the state in healthcare um, and now education, and I think this is a great combination of healthcare and education, and there's a lot of great things we can do. Um, I'm originally from Salt Lake. I grew up right here on the avenue, so this is home to me. I live up in Layton uh, with my wife. We have five kids. Uh, ages range from three to 15. Um, I'm, I'm proudly wearing my, uh, my Eagle Scout pin today. My 15-year-old just got his Eagle Scout award um, a couple weeks ago, and I was a Scout Master, so that was a fun so um, I came over here from the Department of Health where I was the director of the Office of Primary Care and Rural Health. And so I've spent about four years um, in the rural health uh, field and getting to know all of the rural hospital administrators, uh, working on uh, financial and operational improvement. And I just felt like it was a really great transition for me to come over here and to work with many of the same customers that I was already familiar with and, and working with. So I'm just thrilled to be here and want to say thank you. Great. Well, well, we appreciate you being here and we'll, we'll, we'll welcome you and we'll be hearing from Matt later in our m m m m meeting. Uh, Ray, I think, I believe we have a quorum. Is that correct? We have seven, if I counted correctly. So we have uh, our only action item. Uh, for our meeting to what day is actually the approval of the minutes from our last meeting on December 4th. So if there are uh, no questions or concerns about the, mid, about the minutes, I would entertain a motion for approval. So moved. We have second, second all in favor of approving the December 4th board meeting minutes, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the minutes stand approved. We'll uh, now move to our uh, uh, reports, and we'd like to uh, welcome Brent Legg of, of Connected Nation, who has joined us this morning. The first report that we'll uh, receive uh, is the 2019 K-12 Tech technology inventory uh, report. So Brent, please. Well, good morning. Uh, again, my name is Brent Legg. I'm Vice President of Government Affairs for Connected Nation. We're a 501c3 nonprofit organization that has had the privilege of working on this Utah School Technology Inventory Project now uh, for three iterations going back to 2015. Uh, and I will say that it's um, truly a privilege to once again have worked with the Utah Education and Telehealth Network. Um, we are a, a national organization in scope, and um, we work with a lot of different state government ent entities across uh, the entire United States. Uh, and I will say that um, the most, one of the most, well, truly the most professional and well-run organizations that we work with on a daily basis uh, is UETN. Uh, so uh, kudos to your leadership team and to the folks who uh, all the way down um, uh, the organization. We have truly enjoyed our work with you uh, going back to 2015, and I think we've got some exciting uh, things to report to you today. So thank you for the opportunity um, to it. Uh, the report uh, on your uh, table. Um, there are also uh, loose leaf uh, statewide uh, summary uh, document, as well as some examples of uh, district and charter school one-pagers that were developed for each school district uh, and charter uh, school in the state. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about those uh, a little bit later in the in the presentation. 
The, just by way of orienting you to the report, uh, at the beginning of the document uh, is a short executive summary, uh, pulling out some of the key findings, uh, followed by a section that reviews um, the actual inventory results. Uh, there's a section uh, focused on specifically at the end of that section called district charter comparisons, so you can see uh, specifically how some um, uh, findings for school districts compare with individual charter schools. Uh, and then there is a, a summary of the inventory uh, methodology, um, how we went about this project again for the third iteration. And then in a conclusion and uh, um, several appendices uh, at the end. The, the printed document that you have in front of you does not include uh, all of the individual one-pagers in, for districts or charter schools. It does not include the appendices because of the size of the document we were trying to, to save paper. But of course, that is available in electronic PDF form, and that will be available for wide distribution uh, upon your approval of, uh, of this effort. So um, very quickly, uh, I want to emphasize some of the things that, that we prioritized uh, as we looked at implementing this project once again. As you can imagine, when you're trying to assess um, and take an inventory of school technology assets across more than 1,000 public schools in a state and to do so in a very short period of time, um, relationship management is a key to that success. And uh, truly, it has been a pleasure to work with, with, uh, with Corey Stokes in, interac in interacting with districts and charter schools across the state. Um, we deployed people on the ground to assist school districts and charter schools that were uh, sort of struggling to get their information in. Um, but ultimately, we can say that we once again, for the third time, have 100% participation. Uh, so every charter school, every school district in the state is represented by the numbers that you'll see here today. Uh, and, we're, and that's the third time that's happened, and we're very um, of that result. Um, project management has been key. We assigned a project manager to this project. Of course, Corey was involved uh, on behalf of UETN. Uh, and I think I speak for Corey when I say that it was a relatively seamless process. This has become a well-oiled machine now that we are uh, into our third iteration. A component of this year's inventory that is different from the past two cycles was the development of a custom data collection portal. Uh, we worked with UETN. Uh, for um, many months, uh, developing a new data collection portal that would serve this project in perpetuity uh, over many coming years. Uh, it was built from the ground up. It was built with a lot of feedback uh, from school districts and charter schools in mind, um, knowing how they input their data, how they prefer to input their data, how they prefer to go in and edit their data, keep their data up to date. Um, and we built it in a way that it could be exported to other states. We've heard from other state education department CIOs that there's a lot of interest in replicating what Utah has done here. Um, and so there's an opportunity to replicate this and export this work to other states. Um, so I think uh, as we went through the portal development process this time, back in the first iteration of this, uh, back in 2015, we had only 14 weeks from contract execution to delivery of this final report back in 2015. And we had to build a data collection portal uh, to, uh, to collect the data back then. And we really took an off-the-shelf product that was meant for survey uh, collection, survey taking, called Survey Gizmo. Uh, we, uh, we created some custom code um, and implemented that portal, and it worked well. But surveys are generally meant to be sequential. They ask questions, and then they ask the next question, and then they ask the next question. And so when you're trying to take uh, all of this information in from school districts, they're not necessarily prepared to answer those questions in sequential order. Uh, and so we wanted to create a data collection portal that would allow them to jump right to a specific question, input data, save that information back out, and, uh, and then go back into it if they want to um, and, uh, and make changes. And so the, the portal that we developed, I, I think, will serve this project for many, many years to come. Uh, we, we spent a lot of time thinking about uh, data collection design, how to ask the right questions uh, in, in the way that school districts and charter schools would understand what we were trying to capture. 
We spent a lot of time working with Rich and his team on communications and making sure that everyone was aware that this was happening and that they to respond uh, quickly and accurately. Uh, and then we tried to develop uh, some sustainable tools and processes that will, again, further support future iterations of this project uh, down the road. Um, uh, quite a long, uh, quite a lengthy timeline uh, for this iteration of the inventory. Phase one uh, really uh, began in May of uh, 2018. So we've been working on this project for this third iteration since May of 2018 to get to today. Um, with the first um, a few phases dedicated again to that portal redesign. Uh, we launched the portal in phase four on October 7th of 2019, uh, and we began the initial data collection, and we delivered a preliminary report on findings um, to the UETN leadership in December. Uh, we finalized the data collection across all school districts and charters at the end of November, um, and we uh, conducted in-person site visits to non-responsive districts and charters, uh, I believe it was shortly after Thanksgiving. Uh, in uh, ultimately culminates today in phase six, where we are delivering this presentation to you. I want to dive into some of the results. Um, it was very interesting, I think, to see the number of Chromebooks that have bus schools uh, per team. Um, there is a huge upward trend in the deployment of Chromebooks specifically uh, across Utah schools. So I'll orient you to the colors that you see here on the screen. Uh, red are 2019 results. That's the current iteration. 2017 is in gray and 2015 is in navy. And you can see here that there are, there are 421,000 Chromebooks that have been deployed across Utah schools uh, as of 2019. Uh, which is up from 266,000 in 2017 and up from nine uh, in uh, 2015. Uh, there was a slight uptick uh, in iOS tablets, uh, but you can see that desktops using Windows um, have declined uh, rather significantly. Uh, laptops using Windows have increased, but not nearly to the same degree as, as Chromebooks. Uh, Mac use, uh, both laptops and desktops, have been relatively steady uh, throughout the years. And as you can see, Windows and Android tablets uh, are, are far less um, uh, than anything else uh, that has been deployed. Uh, figure two um, are computing devices available for educator, teacher use. Um, desktops using Windows remains the predominant um, piece of equipment that teachers use across the state. Um, second to that are iOS tablets and Mac laptops. Uh, Windows laptops are fourth, and uh, Chromebooks are, are fairly distant fifth. Um, and you can see those numbers are relatively steady. There is a higher, seemingly a higher turnover and purchase rate for school for individual student equipment. Uh, more so than um, uh, equipment for educators. Figure three, uh, mobile device deployment policies across Utah schools. Um, uh, most devices that have been deployed across the state are on a cart for in-classroom uh, in use. 67% of the devices that we saw on the past slides are on a cart uh, for in-classroom use. Um, that is represented in, in second to that 21% are deployed on a one-to-one -one basis, but they, they cannot be removed from the school. Uh, only 9% of devices are deployed on a one-to-one -one basis where students can take those devices at home or to home at night, which is interesting. Uh, and, and I think we want to uh, perhaps, as we think about future iterations of this inventory, deeper into that question to try to find out, well, why is that? Is it a homework gap issue? Is there a lack of connectivity at the home where educators simply just don't feel uh, like they have the, 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 the reliability of a reliable internet connection in the student's home in order to be able to send the device home and make it useful? And of course, uh, if, if Chromebooks are the primary device that are being deployed, those devices are heavily dependent upon an internet connection. So uh, I think that's something that would be worthwhile in studying a bit more uh, down the road. Um, Figure four, uh, and I'm, I'm rushing through these a bit because I know that there's, <laughs> there are a lot of slides here and I want to try to get through this content. I think we had uh, 30 minutes allotted for this presentation, so I want to go rather quickly, and if there are questions, uh, I would be happy to take those uh, at the end. 
but also if there's anything that's that's super pertinent that you'd like to to uh, to ask please do interject uh, as we go through these uh, figure four uh, talks about um, technical support staff um, that are available uh, to support um, uh, devices. So there are 1,212 devices on average uh, for every technical support staff member. Um, and 145.3 teachers assigned uh, as a ratio against uh, FTE instructional tech support staff. So that's, the, that's on average statewide the weight that technical support staff are carrying in terms of their responsibilities. Uh, figure five speaks uh, specifically to the percentage of, of Utah schools that benefit from volunteer technology support assistance. As you can see, um, the vast majority of school districts uh, and charter schools uh, do not use uh, volunteer assistance. They rely on um, uh, staff, employees, and contractors. Um, but there is some significant uh, volunteer staff out there in a percentage, a small percentage of, of school districts and charters. Figure six um, focuses on uh, Wi-Fi um, and specifically the Wi-Fi protocols that have been deployed uh, across Utah school districts. Uh, you can see that 95% um, of school districts in Utah as of 2019 have deployed the latest 802.11 AC uh, protocol on their, night, on their uh, wireless networks, uh, and that number has been gradually ticking up um, over time, as you can see. Figure seven uh, is how school Wi-Fi connections were designed. This was a, uh, a new question uh, or a new take on this question that was added this year to determine how school networks uh, are, are the extent to which uh, professionals are designing uh, school Wi-Fi installations. So 53%, uh, the figure in um, uh, of, of uh, uh, school districts uh, are, are designing their networks using in-house professionals uh, to engineer their networks. Uh, another 24% uh, use a contractor to engineer their networks. And then 21% um, uh, have networks that are not professionally engineered. Figure eight, uh, when Utah schools had their Wi-Fi networks reviewed, this is essentially um, uh, basically the, the amount of time uh, since uh, the Wi-Fi network was assessed in terms of uh, signal penetration and network quality. Um, and it, and the, the, the figures here vary. Um, as you can see, um, networks that were reviewed in the last year, 22% of school districts uh, said that was the case. Uh, in Navy, 38% networks were reviewed within the last two to five years. Uh, and then in gray, a uh, network has not been reviewed post-installation. And some of the reasons why a network was reviewed having post-installation was because it was just installed. So there is a little bit of a problem that uh, if a network was just installed, there's no reason to immediately go back and do that assessment uh, once the initial installation assessment was complete. Figure nine, uh, the portions of school buildings that are covered by adequate Wi-Fi, and this is a perceptual question uh, based on uh, the professional opinion of IT staff uh, at the school districts. 45% uh, of school districts uh, say that 100% of the campus has adequate Wi-Fi coverage. 52% say 80 to 99% of the campus has adequate Wi-Fi, uh, and a very small percentage of, of school districts are less than that. Figure 10 uh, speaks to the percent of Utah schools reporting to Wi-Fi connected, and this is also a perceptual question uh, based on um, input from staff. 52% uh, of districts say that no noticeable outages occurred. 41% said one to four outages occurred, uh, and then a far, few, far fewer um, uh, report that outages occurred at a higher level than that. Um, Figure 11 speaks to noticeable Wi-Fi slowdowns in the last year. Uh, again, 57% of school districts and, and charters are reporting that, uh, that slowdowns happen less than 10% of the time. 35% uh, report no noticeable slowdowns. And again, a much smaller percentage uh, show that, that slowdowns are occurring more frequently. Figure 12 speaks to the wide number of Wi-Fi access points per classroom per instructional space. And as many of you know, this has been a rather contentious question in years past. 
because what we're trying to assess here really is the extent to which a Wi-Fi network has been engineered. Um, has it been thoughtfully planned? Um, we're not necessarily trying to reach a one-to-one -one ratio of access point to instructional space, but we did keep this question in the inventory for the purposes of marking the number. And as you can see, despite the fact that this is, uh, we're not necessarily trying to hit a one-to-one -one ratio on access point deployment, um, the number is ticking up. The density of the network, the density of the access points uh, that are being deployed is ticking up from year to year from 0.58 uh, access points per classroom or instructional space in 2015 to 0.88 uh, today. Figure 13 speaks to the average age of wireless hardware in Utah schools. Um, and this is specifically uh, gear that supports uh, Wi-Fi networks. Um, and as you can see, that 20% uh, uh, of wireless hardware uh, is four or more years older. 30% uh, is three years older. 29% um, is two years older. Uh, and then within uh, the last year or newer than one year, 11% uh, respectively. So that's a fairly uh, even distribution across the years, and it, it essentially shows that Utah schools are refreshing their hardware according to a cycle. Um, and of course, uh, now that, um, that E-rate is uh, permanently supporting Category 2 Wi-Fi uh, installation, we're going to, I think, see more, a more predictable uh, and even cycle uh, to the refresh of that hardware. Uh, figure 14 speaks to the average age of wired hardware, wired networking gear. Uh, and as you can see, much more of the wired networking gear uh, is older. Uh, so 40% of wired networking gear uh, inside uh, Utah schools are, is more than four uh, compared to 21% at three years old, 28% at two years old, and then a small fewer, uh, smaller percentage for one year old or less. Um, I, I will offer my own opinion, and Corey probably has an opinion on this too, I would imagine. Um, I, I think it is probably the case that wired uh, gear, when it was purchased, was capable of delivering uh, the type of, um, uh, of connectivity and does not, you know, at, at 100 gigabits internally uh, on, a, on, a, uh, on a network inside a school building. Uh, it's probably a little more sustainable and lasts a little longer. Uh, but uh, what we see deployed in terms of wireless hardware. And wireless hardware has improved in terms of speed and latency uh, significantly over the last five to ten years. So I think it's been more of a desire to refresh that and let some of the existing wired base. That's my opinion, Corey. I don't know if you have any other thoughts to that. We presented this to the TAC, I think, last week, Gary, mm -hmm. and talked a little bit about this specific data point. It was interesting to me as well that there was so much lag or, or difference in, in the time we upgrade versus the wireless. Clearly, they all said in this TAC that we buy them to last a little longer. We buy yeah. them to last eight to, to nine years at times. And yeah, in fact, we suggested that it would be helpful to maybe add a another category there because four years for wired hardware is not very long. I don't know of any of us that recycle our wired switches that quickly. So I'd be more interested to see how many are eight plus. I mean, that would be more meaningful to me. And, and we jotted that down and we'll... we'll That's great feedback. That, so. Yep, fantastic feedback. We can definitely do that. I, I just want to say uh, yes. from the University of Utah, we're seeing that People just don't want to plug in anymore. They, they want to go to wireless. Yeah. And if you've got plenty of wireless capacity, they don't see the need to do that. So we've done the same thing. We're really putting money into wireless yeah. and less into the plug-in. And I just wonder if that's something that's happening across the school. It sounds like it is. Yeah, I think that's an element of it, too. Um, I mean, many Chromebooks you can't even physically connect to, uh, you know, a wire. Um, 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 I, I think it's a combination of that factor plus the fact that the, the wired gear that has been purchased and installed is, is capable of serving a longer period of time. Um, and there, there's frankly been um, more innovation on the wireless side that has resulted in a, in a desire for, for more frequent refreshes on the wireless side. 
Yeah. Uh, just a quick comment too. I'm wondering if this is uh, something to do with the E-rate cycle. Mm. A lot of that wired equipment is purchased through E-rate funds, so could very well be that too. That may be a factor in this as well. Yeah, indeed. All right. Um, Moving on, figure 15 uh, speaks to the top instructional uh, software tools that have been deployed in Utah. Uh, the interesting thing to note here is that there has been a fairly significant decline uh, in the use of Microsoft Office uh, in school districts from 2015 to 2019, uh, while Google Apps for Education have remained relatively steady. Um, uh, we did ask and add um, a question about Adobe Creative Suite, this inventory. Uh, we had not asked about that in the past. Um, Canvas, uh, the LMS uh, that's available to school districts in the state, is widely deployed in 60% of, uh, of school districts. Um, we've noticed that there has been a decline in the use of, of YouTube as an instructional tool. Um, which was interesting to me because uh, it does seem like video um, for instructional use is becoming more pervasive, and yet that's not what the data tells us uh, for uh, this, this cycle. Um, moving on to figure 16, uh, student information systems that are used by Utah schools, uh, Aspire uh, remains um, the predominant uh, SIS that has been deployed. Uh, and uh, the use of that software is, is relatively uh, steady across the state. Figure 17 speaks to schools that own digital uh, textbook licenses. Um, the vast majority of schools, 77%, report that some textbooks are available with a digital software license, uh, but not all of them. 10% uh, of school districts have licenses for all of their textbooks, uh, and 13% say there are no digital textbook licenses owned at all. Figure 18 speaks to uh, the types of digital textbook licenses that are deployed or that are available for school districts, um, uh, specifically among schools that do not own licenses for every subject. So uh, math and language arts um, by far dominate uh, the textbook licenses that are available digitally uh, compared to much fewer um, in science, uh, career and technical education, and uh, in social studies. Um, when we asked schools what their uh, needs were for digital tools and software, um, we were uh, not so surprised to see that science actually continues to be one area where uh, school districts wish they had greater resources. Um, and then second to that, also surprising, uh, tools for, um, uh, for production, uh, from coding to video editing, et cetera. Um, so science, uh, technology, engineering, and math continues to be the area where, uh, where school districts really need uh, more resources. Figure 20 uh, speaks to, and this is, we're getting into the district and charter comparison section of the report. Uh, this speaks to the uh, computing devices per student. Um, statewide in 2019, uh, there are 1.11 um, devices available per student um, compared to 1.16 in school districts and only 0.86 in charter schools. And you can see how those numbers compare um, to uh, the previous iteration of the inventory, uh, meaning that there has been a significant number of devices uh, deployed. There's been a significant investment deployed uh, or investment made in devices being deployed years. Uh, figure 21 uh, speaks to technical support per FTE. Um, charter schools actually have more resources for technical support uh, than school districts, but one could argue also that school districts use those resources more eff effectively and efficiently. Um, but interesting numbers nonetheless. Uh, figure 22 speaks to the average number of wireless access points per classroom. Um, Wi-Fi networks are certainly denser in um, instructional buildings uh, in school districts than they are in, in charter schools. And I think that probably speaks to the nature of the fluidity of many uh, charter schools and where they meet and the buildings that they use uh, and the permanence of those buildings. Um, so but then the numbers support that. P3A uh, is the average age of wireless gear in schools. Again, comparing districts to charter schools. Um, it's, it's interesting uh, to me that uh, the numbers in terms of trend lines are relatively consistent 
across district and charter uh, in terms of, of age of wireless gear. And 23B shows uh, wired gear in much the same way. Um, again, um, uh, wired gear for district schools compared to charter schools is significantly older, getting back to the, the question that we were discussing earlier. Um, uh, the wired gear in charter schools does tend to be uh, newer. Figure 24 speaks to instructional uh, tools and software needed by schools versus, or school districts versus uh, charter schools. And we can see that uh, while uh, science, um, uh, technology, engineering, and math, you know, continues to be the, the top reported need, the need is less among charter schools than in districts, um, which was an interesting thing. Figure 25 speaks to digital content licenses agreement, license agreements between uh, or among districts and charter schools. Um, you can see that the numbers are fairly consistent across the board uh, in terms of owning digital licenses for all textbooks versus owning some but not all. Um, there is a significantly higher percentage of, of charter schools that do not own any digital content licenses um, uh, than there are for school districts. Uh, in terms of ones that are reporting that they, uh, they don't own any at all. Um, very quickly, I want to show you the, uh, just orient you to the uh, one-pager document. So you have a sample of the one-pager document in front of you. Uh, you also have the statewide summary, which is more like a three-pager type document. Um, uh, we wrestled with how much information to put on these one-pagers. Um, as you can see, they are quite busy. Uh, but I think there was a desire to um, pack as much information as we possibly could onto the page. Uh, more information is better than less information. So while it can be a little bit overwhelming and a little bit uh, difficult to digest, it was a conscious decision to put a lot of content on these documents. Um, so um, the upper left-hand corner of the document uh, speaks to just simply some, some uh, statistics and facts related to the charter school or district uh, in terms of overall area population and enrollment, um, things that may be useful, particularly as Ray presents um, these findings to uh, legislators. Uh, we'll see how it's easy to look and see how one district compares to another in terms of demographics and statistics. Uh, by taking a look at those, uh, uh, that fact sheet in the, or that fact table in the top left-hand corner. Uh, Wi-Fi networks, you'll see, are directly under that, um, uh, followed by um, the age of networking gear uh, in the schools within that uh, 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 particular charter or district. Uh, the number of computing devices uh, are per student are indicated in the, t in the next column uh, at the top. Uh, followed by the specific number of devices reported according to operating system uh, for that district or charter school, uh, followed um, uh, mobile device deployment policies, uh, how many devices are being um, sent home uh, versus on a cart for, for classroom use uh, versus deployed on a one-to-one -one basis, uh, and how that compares against the state average. Uh, and then uh, the final section in the bottom right-hand corner uh, is full-time equivalent technical support staff um, across schools as compared to uh, statewide averages. Um, the example follows uh, much the same. Uh, it's the same type of information. Uh, you should, again, have a, a sample for both a charter school and a district in front of you. And that brings me to the conclusion of my report. So I would be more than happy to, to entertain other questions. Yes? So you're uh, going to present to the legislature on this report, and, and you have to do it in five, ten minutes. What would you tell them then about this report that they ought to be aware of and not to be maybe funding? So I would say that the number one takeaway for me, um, that after the passage of House Bill 277, uh, and the investment uh, that has been made in, um, in instructional technology across the state. They can be proud that those investments are going to work and the data um, that those investments are having an impact uh, on the number of, of devices that are deployed, on staff that are, able, uh, that are available to support um, uh, the deployment of, of that technology. Um, and that the trend lines are really up across the board thanks to that investment. 
um, that uh, school districts are, are still, in my opinion, wrestling with how to make use of the devices beyond the classroom. Um, uh -huh. I think the homework gap issue needs to be explored further. Um, significant uh, lack of internet access in the home, and that's why school districts uh, feel uncomfortable uh, sending those devices home. There may be other issues there that need to be uh, dug into a bit more about why school districts uh, may not feel comfortable sending those devices at home, devices home. But um, what's interesting to me is that a, a, an enormous number of devices have been purchased, um, but they're, they're residing in school buildings. So is there a way to make those devices more functional, more impactful uh, by making them available to, to, to send them home with students? Um, I think uh, warrants uh, some further exploration, um, and it's, it's something the legislature needs to monitor. So on the, uh, would you say, what would you say, has, has this made a difference in the education of students? The report would indicate that there's an improvement in education. So, so one thing that we have never attempted to do, uh, and, and Rick may have an opinion <laughs> on this, is to tie the investments to student learning outcomes, right? To uh, improve test scores, improve grades, improve college admittance. Um, we've never attempted to take the, the inventory data and, and track that along with those academic performance measures. Um, I, I think if we were to expand the scope of the inventory in the future or the scope of the study, uh, we might begin to look at those things. And I think we would want to do that in coordination, obviously, with the State Office of Education. And I'm sure Rick has some, has some thoughts in that regard. But interesting to, interesting to see uh, if academic outcomes are improving with these investments. But the data that we were responsible for collecting just simply didn't go there. And maybe to that point, um, we do have an evaluation of the digital teaching and learning program separate from the, this is a great data point. And I think it really does point to the impact of the program, because if you look at what's happened since 2015, there's actually been almost a complete uh, doubling of the number of devices available in schools in a four-year period. So it certainly shows that the investment by both the state and the district has increased to be able to bring technology to schools. And then we're also looking at the uh, additional to that, according to their plans, and that is it making an impact on teaching and learning. Milken is doing that research. Who is? Milken. Milken. Oh, Material. Yeah. They still do that. Material. Material. Yeah, Cheryl. Thank you. There's other person now. So. I think this report speaks to the next step is, is that if all of the public libraries had adequate wireless service in the public library, then if a student didn't have that access in their home, they could go to the local library and continue to do their homework or all of these other things. It's just so interesting about oh, two or three weeks ago we had a snow day where, where all of the state buildings and up in the U were closed too, at least for the morning or maybe for the entire day. I was so surprised how many of my staff at the state library that do live on the Wasatch Front do not have internet access at their home and yet they are paying, are being paid wages. Uh, they're not in the bottom levels of poverty typically, according to the wages, but many of my staff did not have internet access at their home. That was an optional choice that they had, but it was a little bit revealing to me to understand uh, that that was going on, but it's their personal choice, and if a, if a student's parent's personal choice is to not have the internet, then it doesn't make any sense to send those children home with their tablet. Right. Yes, that's, that's true as well. So the chart on the uh, top education software tools, I notice the Adobe Creative Suite is 64%. What does that mean? Because we do have Adobe Creative Suite statewide contract, don't we, Laura? Grade 6 through 12. 6 through 12. Okay, so is that why it's 64%? Yeah, and it didn't, um, that would be my guess, and it didn't show up in previous years because we didn't have that statewide license, even though some of the CTE classes were using it. The other thing on this chart, I think, to keep in mind is this is 
um, self-reported data from the people that were filling out the inventory. So when we saw a preliminary view of this, um, I went back and looked at, for instance, what happened with eMedia. That was a surprise to me. And the usage data on eMedia just doesn't match this. And I think it's because of um, the, you know, who filled out the survey and what was prominent in their mind and what they see happening in classrooms. But we have to compare it with the data on how often it's accessed and how that's changed too. So, they, uh, so the question was to somebody who was observing so this is an actual... It's their perception of what's happening. It's their perception. It's not a count of how many students are using it necessarily. Okay. Yeah, I think that would be, that'd be true. You know, you know, we're looking at... Well, we have, a, we have a tool, Learn Platform, that actually could provide some of that data, and there's other tools that are out there. And as a part of the digital teaching and learning program, they are required to have some kind of a tool that helps them to manage the software. So it might be in the future that we would be able to actually have... The, and actually, these apps right here mirror what we see in the report from Learn Platform, of the, of the right. top statewide used apps, Google Apps for Education, Microsoft Office, Adobe, uh, and that all are, are, tend to be, with real data, tend to be the same. So I think when you look at maybe the first five or six of those, you're probably getting a pretty accurate. After that, it probably does become a little bit more subjective, subjective. of the things that they're doing in their district and how they might report. And how do we benchmark against other states? Do other states do this kind of an inventory? I'm not that we're aware of. I'm not aware of another state that has data. <clears throat> and the interesting thing, you know, I think one of the, the, the great things about this is that that, two, that 2015 report was before the digital teaching and learning program had actually started. So we have really solid baseline data. And then we can see the trends over, we can see the trends over that, over that four year period. My colleagues, no, they, they'd be very envious to have this kind of data. They have no idea what's going on. I, I gave a presentation in Long Beach, California two weeks ago at the uh, Council of Chief State School Officers, uh, the group of CIOs that meet as part of that, uh, that organization, a state education department CIOs, and um, I was giving an overview of, of Connected Nation and what we do as an organization. And, I spoke briefly about this inventory report, and I can tell you that all the, all the CIOs that were in the room uh, around the table were extremely interested in this and wish that they had this level of, of insight into what's going on to their schools, and they simply don't. Um, so I think there's a hunger for that, and I think we do that in developing this this portal um, that other states can uh, can take and adopt. So uh, we've we we have that tool now that we can export and and show how Utah has been a leader on these issues. I have one more question. There's a consistent one percent throughout the report of uh, schools that have no Wi-Fi. I wonder what is the number of schools in Utah, not just the percent, that have no Wi-Fi? I don't have that statistic in front of me, but I, I know we have that information. So um, let, let Corey and I get back to you on that, if you don't mind. Um, it's a very small, I mean, it's one or two schools, I would imagine, Corey, right? Yeah. Yeah. We'll yeah, we'll, we'll get it to you, yeah. Um, so I'm listening to this conversation at the University of Utah. Almost all the students are bring, bringing devices in and plugging into Wi-Fi. I would imagine that perhaps 100% of the students are using their own device. And then uh, I look at the, the uh, report here, and we have 9% uh, of uh, schools uh, where students can take devices home. And then we have libraries where... Um, people that don't have Wi-Fi access. I'm just curious, uh, we, we, we know that in some schools, students can take the devices home. I wonder what the reverse is, uh, how many are bringing devices to school, and does it matter? Or... That's, a, that's a great question. Um, I, Corey, I see you might want to say something on that. <laughs> Ninety-six percent of the university bring their own devices. We we did not do a very good job this last iteration collecting that data. We are planning on doing that and adding that question. That's something we're going to be adding because it is something that we're starting to ask and think through. And, and schools are starting to actually allow BYOD uh, in, into the schools at a higher level. So we will be collecting that data. I think only anecdotally we can say is that most, if you talk to most of the tech directors in the school districts and that, they'll tell you on any given day, 
they have more devices on their network than they have than they have deployed. And sometimes even than they want. Usually by <laughs> double or more. Yeah, it's usually by double. Yeah. Eight, 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 eight. So they are bringing them, but they're also getting a device from the schools. So. And the challenge. Yeah. I'm sorry. I say the number one thing that students want on campus is what good wireless. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's number one, and they bring their own devices, and our labs are shrinking because they don't. Yeah, you know, they they got their own device, and they want it that way. I think the challenge in in BYOD and K12, frankly, is. Uh, and what has caused many school districts to be hesitant to allow for more uh, liberal B BYOD policies um, is the fact that the devices are are not locked. They are, um, you know, the, the 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 student has their own social media applications and games on those devices, and so there's less predictability around uh, how those devices are being used. Are they truly being used for educational purposes when they're on and in use in the classroom? Or are they multitasking and um, you know chatting and and sending messages etc so um, experience and having talked about these issues in other states uh, well and here too uh, frankly that's one of the biggest reasons why uh, BYOD policies have been um, uh, to to uh, to happen um, it's a, it's different at the university setting because you expect a, a, a higher degree of maturity among the students um, and so I, I, I agree that uh, we probably do need to do assessing BYOD policy K-12 level, um, but I'm, I'm not sure we're going to see a significant upward trajectory in that because of the issues that I just mentioned. Let's go. Uh, Brent, thank you very much. Very you. much appreciate this uh, report and time and the help of Corey. Just some concluding thoughts from um, the rate uh, thank you. Uh, thanks again to Connect the Nation for your work and support and to our staff. Corey, thanks for spearheading this for us as well. When we were first asked to, to do this type of an inventory, it was to gather baseline data, as Rick said, so that uh, the legislature could see if we had sufficient resources uh, in our schools to be able to access technology and to access information. And when we, we got that first report and shared that with multiple legislative committees, uh, they took a great leap of faith and recognized the insufficiency of the resources and appropriated millions of dollars for schools to be able to move forward in, in a digital and teaching, digital teaching and learning uh, uh, mode. And so every time we, we do this, it just backs up the fact that, that schools Traditional schools, charter schools, are using those resources very effectively. Uh, they are making progress, and that's what, when we're able to share information like that, that's when you get good legislative uh, support. And so I think, you know, this is a very credible report, and uh, we will be uh, making sure that it is available. Uh, we'll present to any of the legislative committees that want to uh, that need this information. So again, thank you very much. My pleasure. Thanks again for the opportunity. Great. Thank you. Uh, before we move on uh, to our executive director's report, uh, will the individual who was recently uh, elected to the very prestigious America's Public Television Station Board please stand? <laughs> we would like to congratulate Laura. For her election to that board, and, and actually did a little bit of reading on that board, and it is a national prestigious uh, 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 recognition for um, Laura, the great work, and the reputation that she has uh, amongst her uh, peers. So congratulations. We will now turn to our executive director report. All right. Thank you. And, th and congratulations, Laura. That is, what, that is great. Do I need to push this again? Push and hold. Push and hold. Lost its connection, so. Do I need to do back up again?
did not know it would time out on me. Sorry about that. Okay, uh, as you recall, last legislative session, uh, all of our funding that, that we received was uh, changed to one-time funding. And so that was a concern uh, for us because we have ongoing costs. And so uh, during the uh, interim period, we, we worked with legislators and tried to make sure that that funding could be converted back to ongoing funding once they took care of tax reform or whatever they were going to do with that. So the first week of the session, they looked at uh, our, our funding and they, they adopted the base budget. And as part of the base budget, everything that we were appropriated was converted back to ongoing funding. So we, we, uh, we did very well in that regard. So uh, uh, I wanna share with you now where we are at this point, we're at the midpoint of the session, and things are, are looking really well, I think, at this point. I have uh, on the screen there for you, that's our funding request. We uh, have growth and operations, and we have a request for consortium software. For growth and operations, some of it's ongoing, some of it's one time. The consortium software is all ongoing. Uh, request. This is what growth and operations consists of, if you remember. Uh, we have 35 new sites that we need to connect to the, to the network. We have backbone links that need to be upgraded uh, to 100 gig. We have nine of those. We have over 70 telehealth network locations that, that need additional operational funding. Uh, we uh, Colleen has already talked about public libraries and the importance of having good internet connectivity there. That, that, that will help tremendously with the homework gap uh, for those families that do not have uh, internet connections in their home. Uh, it, it's, it's very easy to go to the local public library. The problem, however, public libraries have insufficient funds. And so we're asking for the funding to connect those public libraries, to pay those circuit costs. They're already connected, but they're having to come up with their own budget, and so they're connected at, at a minimal bandwidth. Uh, so we're asking for the funding to connect them. Again, it's just like our schools with a, with a one gig a minimum standard bandwidth. And then we need network monitoring and efficiency tools to be able to uh, do a, a deep dive and to look at at our network and see see how uh, how well it is working and how secure it is. So let me talk about the consortium software. Uh, we have two uh, types of consortium software. The first one is that's for that's Canvas. That's that's where we have a statewide license, and there's a discrepancy in how. Public Ed is funded to use Canvas versus how Higher Ed is funded to use Canvas. This is Higher Ed's uh, uh, appropriation uh, to help them with those, those costs. The green represents the funding that Higher Ed receives right now that they put towards their Canvas license. The total cost of, of Canvas for Higher Ed is 2.55 million. So Higher Ed is having to come up with a, a, a great deal of their budget to, to cover the full costs of, of that learning management system. So what we are, are requesting is 800,000 this year as the first phase uh, for funding for Canvas for higher ed, and then we'll go back again next year and ask for phase two. Uh, that's, that's the Canvas licensing that we're, we're talking about so that eventually higher ed will have the same 100% coverage for Canvas that K-12 has. That's awesome. Then we have the, the Nearpod platform, which uh, I would describe as a, as a productivity tool, is how Senator Reby describes it. As a classroom teacher, she uses it practically every day. It's, it's, uh, it's an interactive tool to work with students to provide, to provide immediate feedback. If, if each school over Nearpod if they have to go out and negotiate for their own license, it's 3.3 million. Uh, if we could do it as a statewide license, we can do it for 1.8 million. So those are, those are the two consortium software licenses that we're looking at. 
So we took that funding request to the Retirement and Independent Entities Committee because we are an independent entity and that's the committee we work with. And they put together their uh, prioritized list. Okay, oh, it's down here, sorry. All right, this is the prioritized list as they uh, determined it. And, re and by the way, Robert, I, I know you, we were wanting to be there. Uh, they scheduled the meeting without me wow. ca catching it. And they, but anyway, okay. their highest, the, the number one priority for them was, uh, we, this is our last year working with Utah Futures, we think. Um, <laughs> and, and so we had, we have about $500,000 of Utah Futures funding that we will not be using. And so we made that well known to the committee and we offered that back to them. And then they, they said, well, we could reappropriate it to help you with your uh, one-time costs. And so we thought that was a great idea. They, their next highest priority is a public safety retirement bill. But then the next two would be our two requests for growth and operations and for consortium software. So when you really look at it, we have the number two and the number three position uh, for their priorities. And I think at this point of the session, uh, things are looking really pretty good. Unless something dramatic comes into play or, or major change like they did last year, uh, I think we're, we're looking really, really pretty good right now at that point. Now the next place, yesterday at 4.30, they had a, the executive appropriations met and our committee chairman presented these priorities. So they will not change. They've been submitted to executive <coughs> appropriations now. So uh, they, they won't change unless they change the funding bill right at the end of the session. Speaking of Utah futures, uh, Patty Norman, one of our board members, our co-chair, she mentioned to me yesterday that uh, the State Board of Education felt strongly that Utah Futures was a, a high priority for them. And so I think they added it to their prioritization list and submitted it uh, to the Education Appropriations Committee uh, for that to be considered. Uh, they feel very strongly that that is a tool that school counselors need to have when they uh, do career guidance counseling. And so I don't know, uh, you know, we thought that we were at the end of, of supporting Utah Futures, but we're, we're glad to continue providing that service if the funding is appropriated. One bill that, uh, it's, a, it's a House Joint Resolution 14 uh, from Representative Lyman, and it's about telegovernment. And the, the resolution just, it, it says that UETN will work with legislative staff in identifying best practice for telegovernment. Mm -hmm. And there are two states that are referenced, uh, Alaska and Arizona, that apparently do a, a good job in allowing citizens uh, access technologically into their committee meetings uh, and, and to be able to make comment regardless of where they live. And so that's what the, the vision is. I was asked to sit with uh, Representative Lyman and express our support. Uh, so I, I know that the board has not taken a position, but I, I did tell them that I, I felt like we were being asked to participate in, in doing the study because of the, the reach that we have statewide where people live, there are schools, there are libraries, there are clinics and hospitals, we're there. We, we have the connections to those, those areas. And so that's probably why they're looking at us to at least help with the study. So I, I didn't have a problem in, in, with the study. Uh, Representative Lyman did his summation and talked about what a great organization we are and what a wonderful job we would do managing telegovernment. So, just just know that, that the joint resolution is a study. That's all it is, is a study. By November, what our findings are, 
But DTS has, usually has the responsibility of providing uh, services for, for government. And I would think that might be a, a, a better fit. But anyway, just wanted you to be aware of that. Uh, okay. Um, let me go on to the next. By the way, this one page has Dave Bueller's on his thing. So. It has what? Your support. Dave Bueller's on oh, his yeah. thing. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, the uh, next thing that I wanted to share with you very briefly was this map right here. You have a hard copy, those of you that are here, you have a hard copy of, of the changes to the network over the last uh, few years. We started with 2012 because that's when I started with UETN. It's in 2012. And I know it looks like an eye exam, but if you look at the pie chart in the upper corner there of the state, in 2012, the amount of traffic and, and, and utilization of the network was 7.625 gigabits per second. Now that number doesn't really ring you know, with, with me, I, I, I don't really understand what that number is, but I can watch the utilization uh, year to year. So from 2012 to 2013, it doubled to 14.3. And then 2014, it, almost, it nearly doubled. 2015, nearly in each succeeding year, a huge increase in the amount of utilization. So in the short time that I've been here, uh, the amount of usage or utilization has gone from 7.625 to now 115.5 gigabits per second. Now that's a significant increase, and a lot of it has to do with the shift in society of, of uh, the utilization of technology and the way that we've changed instruction and delivery of, of, of instruction and information. So I, I think that speaks... Uh, highly of, of UETN uh, uh, being able to stay ahead uh, and making sure that our stakeholders don't have to worry about capacity issues. They don't have to make sure that they have a uh, sufficient broadband. We worry about those kinds of things. We focus on that and they focus on that, which they do best, which is to educate students or provide healthcare services and support. So I, I thought that was a, a Great tool for it. I, yeah, I just wanted to note, too, having uh, a lot of experience with the education delivery in some of the most rural portions of the state, the changing of colors as the years have progressed and the capacity, the network capacity out to some, some extremely rural areas of our state is, is really incredible. So Thank you. great opportunities for those people. So if we go to 20, I understand a lot, we'll have a lot more red line? Yes, we have nine segments that will be changed to red uh, for 2020. Uh, It'll be exciting. It will be. It will be. And, and the ultimate vision that we're looking at is, you know, our backbone is, is we're wanting it to be a 100 gig backbone. And and we're already having conversations, well, why, is, why aren't we looking at a 400 gig backbone? Because eventually that's that's where we will be, and the only reason we're not looking at a, you know 400 gig right now is is funding, uh, I, and, and the the need we don't we don't do it just to make it look great, we do it when utilization justifies the, the need for the increase. Rick, you wanted to make a comment. Well, I was just going to notice. I mean, if you look at the 2016 through 2019 summaries, if you think back, we've also during that time we added almost 400,000 computers in K-12. Uh, which shows how we've had to keep up with, uh, how this has kept up with that. And then again, talking to my colleagues around the country on that, when I mentioned that every one of our schools has at least a gig circuit, they, uh, that doesn't, they can't even fathom how that's been done. That the, you know, the equity that we have, I think Brett can probably... I can vouch for that. <laughs> this doesn't happen in nearly any other state. So. Not only have we increased the number of devices, but the network has been the capacity to take it so that they can be used effectively is, is there. So it's 
it's a great you know partnership that we have Dave I don't want to put you on the spot but you've had experience in two district Logan and now Beaver as the superintendent there do you worry about capacity at all or bandwidth or, or are you doing are we are we making the changes so the schools uh, themselves have the capacity that they need in, in Beaver School District and is very similar to what I was experiencing in Logan so I, I was pleased to find that when I arrived there um, but that said the experience in a rural area is uh, the home use or library use um, anything outside of the school is really difficult and we're finding while we have 100% uh, Chromebook deployment and they go home in Beaver County uh, some of the parents have approached me and, and talked about the fact that their networks that the desire to be able to do homework at the same time still doesn't exist because their home network can't handle all of the Chromebooks of four or five kids uh, or three kids hitting the, the home network all at the same time my grandkids come to visit and if I'm needing to do something on, you know, I have to, I have to tell them to shut down because you know, mine won't, won't handle the traffic. Yeah, and it's amazing because in Beaver County we have these these circuits running right through the county. Uh, we have a hundred gig circuit running through Milford. We have ten gig circuits running through Beaver, and, and we're not connecting to those with the local providers in any way. I, it, it amazes me it's not taken advantage over the demands not there on the commercial side right right well and that is I think the great thing about the model that we do is you know when we work with the telcos you know and they, they put in the fiber for us they're not just putting in the two strands of fiber to go to the school district they're putting all of the, the whole the whole bundle yeah. in, and then that gives them the ability to then offer it to the home to local businesses which we hope they would do so when they built it out, we were the anchor tenant that allowed them to justify the fire both into the rural part of the state. Yeah. That's always something that we told the legislature which they like. Yeah. So we're the most wired state, particularly in rural areas in the country. Mm -hmm. So that, that it's still that gap between getting it from the wires are there. The last mile. Out to the homes. Yeah. That last mile project is still yeah. a, a real thing across the state. I have wondered whether one gig in public libraries, once once you get around to, once once that becomes available to actually rolling out, I don't know whether one gig is enough mm -hmm. or not. Uh, one gig is available in all of the schools. I wonder if that is enough. Or I mean, I know money is limited. Uh, Let me share with you how, how we look at, at those connections. When when we see at a at a single site. 60% utilization that's when we start tracking that, that particular site we watch that carefully that's when we upgrade the bandwidth we increase the bandwidth at that point because if they're at 80% when they're all taking online testing they're spiking above 100% so so at 80% that's that's the, the deciding point when we increase the bandwidth for them and it, it would be no different for libraries we would be looking at the same thing at, at that there's a, a particular area of a library that has huge uh, usage or utilization, then we need to look at is one gig sufficient or not. So. Well, I, I've taken my share of the time. This uh, map is kind of like the, when you see a construction site uh, and they start building it. Uh, this just shows a change over the years. Uh, and anyway, I won't go on, on with that. You can you can see that. See it. You want to see it? Yeah, I really want to see it. Okay. That's cool. We're starting right so here. So this is time lapse. <laughs> you can see the small changes to the network. Is this available online? It is. Okay, on your to the UN to the There's a link in the board docs. There's a link in the board docs. Oh, on board docs. Okay. Yeah. And right. it's about fifty seconds. Sorry, it's about fifty seconds. Um, but then on. The website it loops a few times so you could look at the graph as it grows on the right side or the network map as it changes or the utilization number so different ways to 
get the information. Does the legislature see this? No, not yet. Uh, this is Katie and her, her group uh, did this. Uh, that's cool. uh, and then there's one more thing I wanted you to see. Uh, if you go to About UEN and click on it, and then as you go down, we have a new in a nutshell. And I don't, I'm not going to show it right now, but if you would go and watch that, it's three minutes and two seconds. So if you would watch that, it, it's it's a it's a, a real it's an update to the other in a nutshell that we've used uh, over the years, and it's uh, and that's on the legislative legislature page. It's it's on when you go to our homepage, okay, uen.org, yeah. right hand top right hand side it says about uen. Mm -hmm. You put, click on that, and then scroll down, you'll see. Do you want me to show it? Or? I actually specifically didn't watch it thinking that it was going to be unveiled this time so i would love for you to show it okay. when the board chairman asks you to do something you do it all right this is it i need audio whoops and we understand great things happen when we work together and stay connected let me start that over again I have a sound now. You have it selected for the for share? Oh, I don't know. Yeah, I want to go to your uh, preferences. Is this some preferences? Uh, Apple system. Uh, oh, there we go. There. System preferences. I'm going to sound. Right there. Yeah, I was thinking, let's see, I think I see it. Actually, I couldn't find it. Pretty sure. Oh, the help is on there. The video's always been going on. Yeah, it's yeah. 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 Okay. Thank you. Are you going to post this to the website? It's, it's already, already on the there. website. Already. I didn't see it. Right, okay. And it's in the week on the board docs for this. Yeah, I got that one. Who comes here in the beehive space are industrious and curious. And we understand great things happen when we work together and stay connected. And what's one of the most important ways we connect? UEN and UTN, Utah Education and Telehealth Network. Our infrastructure and applications help connect schools, colleges, libraries, and healthcare providers all across the state at over 1,600 locations in every county and every corner. Take this IT director. She depends on UEN's robust internet backbone and reliable network to manage critical services for her district, from instruction to finances, phone services, meals, and even school buses. For this healthcare administrator, UTN plays a critical role at his small clinic. Our broadband network helps connect healthcare experts, which improves patient care. For others, like this elementary school teacher, UEN helps keep her at the top of her field by giving her access to professional development courses that help her earn new credentials and expand her expertise. Meanwhile, her students have access to cool resources and research tools at school and at home through our website and Utah's online library. So, no excuse not to do that essay. <clears throat> That's the spirit. And at the university level, we save institutions time and money, resources which can be reallocated to their students and staff helping to keep top talent right here in Utah. Talent like this professor. He loves how our interactive video system helps bring distance learners from across the state into one virtual classroom. Hi, everybody. UEN also supports online apps like Canvas, which makes for faster grading and more accurate feedback. Faculty love incorporating video and other media into their courses easily which we know keeps students more engaged. And don't forget what our network does for preschoolers, librarians, television viewers, researchers, and technical colleges. Chances are you probably benefit from UEN and UTN too. In short, Utah Education and Telehealth Network helps keep the Beehive State buzzing. That's because we understand what we're building goes way beyond technology. We're giving people throughout the state access to information, and more importantly, to each other. A technology network and a people network that helps make Utah a great state to live, work, and learn.
That's Utah Education and Telehealth Network. Connect with us at UETN.org. Well Beautiful. Done. Nice job. All right, that's, that's everything I have. And that is on the homepage of the UETN.org, so you don't even have to click on about. It's right on the home uh, page there. So that is great. Thank you, Ray, and to the team for uh, creating that. Okay, we're going to move on to our uh, advisory council reports now. And uh, first up, we're going to invite Rick to give a report on the UEN advisory council. Uh, since we had the video on, I will now be very brief. You know, so that, uh, we had a really good meeting a couple of weeks ago. Um, we uh, first of all had uh, uh, Jen uh, give us a great overview of the American Graduate Grant Program and all the great work that they have been doing in really trying to help, uh, you know, increase graduation in the state. I thought it was a, a great uh, report uh, and was pleasantly surprised at the length of the conversation uh, and uh, dialogue that occurred from uh, from that report um, and uh, would probably be a, a, again another worthy opportunity I think for this board just to you know one of those small programs that really is I think yielding some great results uh, and that but we also talked about uh, the student well-being initiatives at both UCI and uh, uh, USBE uh, well as we know, wellness and social emotional learning and all of that is now becoming a, um, a major topic that, you know, that uh, schools and that are needing to address. And I uh, had some great conversations on that. And then we also uh, met and just discussed briefly, uh, you know, the Utah Rural Schools Association Conference it's, uh, that's coming up uh, this summer again in uh, Richfield. Um, one of the things that they noted is that, you know, for years and years it was in Cedar City every year, uh, the same weekend, and attendance had really sort of slowly gone down over the years. And last year uh, they had the highest attendance I think they've practically ever had, uh, doubling what they'd had the previous year. Uh, and they were hoping to be able to do so, you know, for our rural educators and, and that, it's a great opportunity. And this year it will be in Richfield, on, uh, at Richfield High School, and at Snow, uh, and at Snow College South. Uh, and that. But it was a very informative meeting, and uh, um, just seeing the good work that UEN is constantly doing, that's what the role of that committee is. So thank you. Great. Thank you, Rick. Uh, we'll uh, now go to Matt for the UTN Advisor Council Report. So the UTN um, Advisory Council met uh, February 6th, and we uh, discussed a few openings that um, are on the Advisory Council right now um, that we'd like to fill. We don't have names to present to the board today, but we're working on um, contacting individuals to fill those two positions. Um, and I'll just mention really quickly, we also had a, a good discussion about possibly expanding the size of the UTN Advisory Council. Um, one of the reasons driving that discussion was telehealth is expanding into so many um, specific healthcare areas. Um, and I'm very familiar with, um, you know, dentists doing teledentistry. Um, there's a lot of work happening in um, screenings, um, both dental and vision screenings using telehealth. Um, and so we talked about other fields such as mental and behavioral health, substance use disorder. Uh, we just had a good discussion about uh, possibly expanding um, to some of those additional fields. Um, we had a, a legislative update. I just want to share a few things um, to have you be aware of. There's a House Bill uh, 313. If, if any of you have seen it, this is a, a telehealth parity bill that includes uh, both coverage parity and payment parity. Um, the chief sponsor is uh, Representative Melissa Ballard, and the Senate sponsor is uh, Representative Christensen. 
Um, so that's an important telehealth bill for the state that we're very interested in. There's also two other bills, um, House Bill 35 and House Bill 38 are, are both specific um, telehealth related bills for uh, mental and behavioral health services um, and also substance use and assisting individuals in the justice system as they transition out back into the community um, and using telehealth as a means to help them uh, make that transition and get the care that they need. Um, so those are two other important bills that involve telehealth. Uh, we also discussed a, uh, an appropriation that the Medicaid um, office has requested um, of the Social Services Committee. Um, they have right now uh, been prioritized at $1.3 million for case management for rural uh, Medicaid patients, uh, which, which is also something we're really interested in and understand the, the need in the rural communities um, for those patients using Medicaid to receive telehealth services. Um, other than that, we, we talked about some uh, wins and challenges, some great things happening in the state right now with um, tele-oncology programs, um, some telepharmacy work, uh, working with OUCH on some hypertension and diabetic retinopathy uh, programs using telehealth. Um, yeah, I think that's all the updates that we have. Okay, great. Thank you, Matt. We, so uh, we will look to future discussion and perhaps action items on, uh, on mem membership for that council. Yeah. Great. Okay. Thank you. We will turn to Gary now for the UETN Technology Advisory Committee report. Thank you. Uh, yeah, we've met a couple times since our last board meeting, and some of the topics we've discussed, uh, we, we spent quite a bit of time on EduRoom, um, kind of as how it relates to public ed and uh, the district's use of EduRoom. Internet 2, there were a couple of guests from Internet 2 that were there and presented a, a case study. And um, then we also been discussing a couple of meetings of eSports and just if there's anything that UETM needs to do to be prepared for what's happening or may happen in the future with eSports in schools and how we use that. And we haven't come to any conclusions yet. Matt, but there's been some good discussion though to get that started. And then, of course, we had the presentation of the draft of the K-12 technology inventory that we've, we've gone over here today and had some input on that and some good discussion. So I'm curious about the eSports discussion, but do you have a question? Okay, please? so the University of Utah is an eSports academic department. Uh, started out, they probably did it about 200, yeah, 540 people in the eSports program now, and there's uh, it's the fastest growing competitive sport in the world. Mm -hmm. Soon we'll pass baseball, football, and there is talk about esports arenas on this campus, I know. But uh, apparently, it is now past the one point six trillion dollar. It, it, it makes more money now that is video games than uh, all of the entertainment companies combined. And um, there's a company called Twitch that is now in Utah that has stolen many of our employees. And Twitch is a network that you go to as video streaming to watch video gamers play. And it's the fastest growing audience in all of television. So it just was uh, kind of disgusting to me, but I <laughs> <laughs> that we would have this valuable asset that is now going to video games, but the video games are big, big tonight. It's a whole industry. And it's, yeah, it's, it's a whole industry, but the it, it, the video games, but the people who play those video games very well make millions of dollars. Yeah. Uh, they're superstars. And um, they said they sold out the Staples Center in a half an hour, where they all go to the Staples Center and watch video gamers duke it out. So if you've got strong thumbs and uh, 
dexterous. Very dexterous fingers. They do have exercises, you know. but it, it's, that's incredible that that's happened so fast. Isn't the university offering scholarships to mm -hmm. gamers? Doesn't don't they have a team? Do you have a team <laughs> have with a scholarships? Team. They do have a team, and they. I just talked to the uh, the Denton, who I guess we almost took first place, but didn't quite. I'm actually on the injured reserve team. <laughs> <laughs> finger, so I... It might be a red shirt year, though. I'm still waiting for, to hear how that goes. So. Thank you. Please. So, Steve, uh, as a basketball you need a mic. Oh, you need a mic. Let's get a mic. Just come up to the table. Yeah, have to come up to the table, Mike. I was just adding, um, to the basketball game the other night, they used the gamers um, as a halftime entertainment and showed it up on the big jumbotrons and you could actually see them up close and playing and their, key, their desktops and the whole deal. And then they had an announcement that was hosting it. It was like a, you know, a fight type scenario. Um, and it was very entertaining and very, uh, I like it. It was fun. It was fun to watch. So, I'm just going to add that, you know, when the tech directors of the districts have been meeting, esports has come up multiple times. In fact, at our meeting here in a few weeks, we're going to have uh, Tom Osmond from Dell, um, who's had a lot, uh, done a lot of background research on this in K-12. He's going to talk to the tech directors to some of his ideas, uh, some of his things that he's that he's discovered about esports. But we do have some schools and districts that do have. Uh, programs now up and running. I don't know if you have anything in Beaver or not yet. So, so there's not enough bandwidth in Beaver. It's a ten gig. I'm surprised they haven't dug a hole. Uh, the only place they can compete in Beaver is on the school campuses, and and so far we're not inclined to open up that opportunity at school. <laughs> so is that a Beaver Dam? That's a Beaver Dam. <laughs> yes. <laughs> There you go. I, I, I'm still trying to help my parents in the community believe there is such a thing as esports, and I had that conversation just yesterday with some parents. Uh, they, they can't even believe this exists. So, well, well, it all started here in Utah with Nolan Bushnell and Pong. Yeah. Um, so uh, we've been ideally situated this they, they would love to have an esports arena here and kind of honor of, of that so well it sounds like it's good to hear that our uh, technology advisor committee is talking about <coughs> the potential e application the impression that jim he knows we may have to do something he just we just don't know what yeah to be prepared for what's coming yeah. from esports well, good. Yeah. good good well, thank you for uh, those uh, reports. We're going to quickly move on now uh, to our first discussion item, a uh, broadcast services item, and we'll turn some time to Laura. Thanks. I have um, four things to talk about and interrupt me if you have questions. The first is you should all have um, a hard copy of this. This is our local uh, community service report. It's a requirement from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting because we receive a community service grant that we document the services we provided to the community. And of course, for us, the community is the whole state. So we organize this around um, the parts of our strategic plan. Uh, you'll see infrastructure, education, community engagement, um, television, broadband, healthcare, and so on. Um, I think there's a great combination of stories and accomplishments, and I just want to make sure that you are all aware of it. It's also linked in the board docs materials. Can I interrupt real quick? I, I just want to comment on how fantastic this is and how well done this is. It, it really speaks well of the organization and, and what's going on at UEN and UETN in general. Uh, but when, when I got my hands on this and started thumbing through it, it just shouts at you every page how wonderful the things are that we're doing. Thanks. Really Thank helpful. And I did want to mention one of the things that I think, um, I agree with you, I think this is the best one we've ever done because we've been doing this for many years. Um, we got a lot of input from our advisory council. We showed examples from other reports and from other industries um, using Nearpod and polled them on uh, which one did they prefer and which one did they recommend and even showed um, different drawings from reports and have them circle the area that drew their attention. So there was some really um, useful input using Nearpod 
from the advisory council to help uh, inform this work. So thank you. I'll, I'll also pass that along to the people that work on it. Um, the second one is just a quick update on federal funding. So first thing to mention, um, federal funding comes to the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and then is redistributed to TV and radio stations across the country. We are also forward funded. So this last year, when it was fiscal year 2020, the budget was actually for 2022. This coming year, um, you probably saw the president released his view of the budget, which completely eliminates funding for public broadcasting in the country. Which happens every year. It, it's consistent, <laughs> yes. Well, at least for the last three years, it's been that way, yes. Um, there's a lot of bipartisan support for public broadcasting. So, uh, and again, the president doesn't set the budget, the Congress does. So we imagine that uh, that will be changing. And for us, as they're talking about the FY21 budget, it's funding that we would be potentially receiving in 2023. The reason broadcasting is forward funded by two years, um, there's two reasons. One is uh, it gives stations time Production is a long, long haul, and so it gives stations time to fundraise around future projects. But the other important reason is it insulates current lawmakers from editorial decisions. So um, what's happening two years from now wouldn't be, they wouldn't have a direct input. It's, it's a little bit of a firewall between um, that kind of influence. So we're hopeful that things will be looking up. Um, last year, we had a $20 million increase in our federal appropriation. And it's still about $80 million short if you account for the growth from inflation. So the request this coming year will be um, an increase of $80 million to cover that um, gap. So it's a total of $515 million, and that includes things for um, preschool, the stations, community service, civic engagement, public safety, all those kinds of things. I'll keep you posted as we learn more mm, about that. So question. Um... Since KBYU dropped out of public uh, broadcasting, uh, does that give you access to more PBS programming to run on Channel 9? Yeah, it's um, so the good news is it gives us access to more funding from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting because they do a formula based on the size of your station. Um, but we're not a PBS member, so we don't have any PBS-funded programming. It all goes to PBS Utah. Sure. We don't pay membership. Um, so we're still... What, what about the other you know, American public broadcasting? Yeah, events? and uh, NETA and okay. others. Um, yeah, we still have access to a lot of public media content. But um, I think it's been good news for PBS Utah, um, formerly known as KWD, because they're the exclusive provider of that content now in the state, which is a good thing. Um, so speaking of content, the third item is we were notified that the station that we're currently running on 9.2 called MHC Worldview, have, they have decided to end their service at the end of this month. So um, we're, we have received calls. They've been running uh, messages on the channel. This is the one that has the international news and culture and the dramas that Ray really likes and yeah. um, tells me about. I'm sick. <laughs> um, so we've had viewers contact us and we're telling, reminding them about the international um, news programs and culture programs that are on our other three channels. Um, we have been looking at what to do with uh, that extra bandwidth. And um, that leads to the fourth item that I wanted to point out. Um, a few months ago, maybe a year ago, you may recall, we had some guest speakers come here and talk about the new broadcasting standard that's been adopted, ATSC 3.0, and it's now being called Next Gen TV. There's some colleagues at uh, Michigan State University and their Department of Communications, which runs their public TV station, that have opened up a new Next Gen TV Innovation Lab. So I linked to their news page so you can see some of the experiments that they're doing. But they met with faculty and um, have developed experiments around transportation, early childhood learning, um, interaction with government, which I think is relevant to what's been going on with the legislature this year, um, and, and other things. So we've had some recent calls with them. And really, the update for this is to let you know that uh, Next Gen TV is still moving forward in the industry. Salt Lake City has been recognized as one of the top 30 uh, markets where adoption is expected to happen quickly. 
And um, it's something that we're continuing to research along with other public TV colleagues to see what the opportunities are for advancing our mission with this new, new opportunity. That's all I have for broadcast. Great. Any other questions? It's good to be a rapid follower. <laughs> well, it's a interesting. Bleed, not a bleeding entry. Um, if it does develop, we ought to be right there. Yeah. yeah, and these experiments happening at Michigan State, um, yes, I think we'd love to learn from them and their, <laughs> their wins and their losses. Um, one of the applications they talked about is directly related to telegovernment, where uh, people can be viewing a session and then have interactivity on their screen to be able to um, comment on it or vote on things or, or provide direct input. They're also deploying a test in their stadium, so um, people, as they're... Um, watching the game can have a, a, a second channel where they're communicating or getting updates or um, things like that. So it's kind of interesting to follow. Great. Thank you. Our uh, last uh, discussion item, uh, uh, we'd like to just open up, uh, have a discussion with the board about our next meeting, uh, which is uh, scheduled to be our uh, retreat. If you remember historically, once a year the board uh, gets together and has an all-day uh, meeting. Uh, in talking with the leadership team, the retreat this year, uh, it's important every year, but it's going to be significant this year because the five-year uh, strategic plan uh, for um, UETN has been a uh, has been a 2015 to 2020 strategic plan, uh, and, and so we'll be looking to uh, to the leadership team and staff of UETN to uh, begin to redevelop the strategic plan going forward. Uh, I think it's important for members of the board to be able to provide input and participate in that strategic planning process. And I believe the retreat is an opportune time to be able to do that. So wanted to get your thoughts uh, about how best to go about the retreat, what are some ideas that you have about how we conduct the uh, uh, retreat, what would be most beneficial uh, to members of the board, uh, what would you like to get out of the retreat, as well as from the leadership team and staff, uh, what would they hope to uh, be able to gain from a board uh, retreat as well. So just like to open up the discussion now and get some feedback, please. I'd like to see a uh... Just a, an overall report on uh, what's been accomplished on the five-year plan. Okay. And then uh, a look at uh, a SWOT analysis of what uh, the strengths and weaknesses of the organization are and how those can be, uh, weaknesses could be improved. And then the opportunities and threats, what's in the environment, what's the future technology that we need to look for so that we can plan to embrace those in the future environment that, um, Five years from now, things will be a lot different. Mm -hmm. We need to anticipate what that difference is and then set goals so that we can be positioned to take advantage of that future environment in a, in a significant way. Mm -hmm. Technology disruption is something that would be a part of that discussion, just to make sure that we're doing relevant things. I think if we did that and then just um, looked at maybe some the technological projections on how mm -hmm. much bandwidth is gonna be needed in the future, what the baseline services are for UETN mm -hmm. and uh, what potential scope creep there might be that would take us off our off the, the mission of what UETN does. Thank you. Other thoughts? What, what Steve's asked for there, I think will get at this, but I'm just curious what were the surprises uh, in the last five years? Uh, you know, where did we end up that we didn't expect to be? Uh, I think will inform us a little bit of how our thinking needs to go towards this next five years as well. One of the things that we uh, discussed previously, um, looking at our four major constituency groups, is, is of course, Lowe's groups, public ed, higher ed, libraries, telehealth, they're of course moving forward with their own strategic plans 
and uh, looking at the, the future and as a service organization, are we aligning our priorities with their priorities? And so the, the board represents those four constituency groups, but actually invite someone to come in from each of those four groups to spend uh, some time presenting on their priorities and their strategic plan. Uh, plans to make sure that uh, that's informing us. So having someone like a uh, um, Commissioner Wolstenhume come and speak uh, perhaps a little bit on the future of higher ed and um, some key areas that they are wor working on and doing the same with libraries and public ed and telehealth. Is that something that would be helpful? I think that would be perfect. Yeah, it's a good idea. Okay. And maybe that would be a you know, from the K-12 side, um, Patty doing that presentation that she was going to do for this meeting but couldn't because of legislative things on mm -hmm. what the international look and how Utah is being looked at. But the presentation that she made in China. Yeah. The portrait of a graduate. Yeah. Okay. No, 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 but that might be really good to have those, a baseline from higher ed and a baseline, you know, Yeah. I just can't help but think that, that most of uh, – the different components of strategic plans with these, those four major constituency groups are going to involve technology and, and are going to involve support and 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 and, and how we as an or, how we as an organization uh, could be asked to serve and uh, uh, help uh, uh, support those uh, different areas. Please, um, 5G is an area that I think we need to explore. Uh, I would really like to get a report uh, with that in light of where the uh, powder project's been going and what we're getting out of that right now, information-wise. Uh, I also think AI is a topic for conversation. I, I don't know that that's outside of our bounds to look at what AI is going to do to our organization in the coming years as well. Well, the analytics have drive it, too. Yeah. Making sure you got good analytics because AI isn't very good with that. Good data. Um, I was thinking um, with the ATM and putting out an RFP in April uh, for some public ed districts, but the key is it's a complete, it's a new redesign of a different type of a platform they're talking about. And Jeff, maybe someone on the technical people could talk about it, but it's designing how we uh, provide internet. It's a, it's, a, it's a complete different type of platform we're looking at from that and that we're requesting. And that, is, to me, is a big game changer for your districts on how we provide um, how we're providing internet connectivity with the design. What, what did you say the time frame is on that? We're putting the RFP will go out first of April. Okay. And we're going. And there's two school districts that we're looking at right now that will be going out. It will be Davis School District and Granite. Granite. Okay. So and, but I think to bring everyone up to speed to know what the design, what Kevin Quire is looking. Yeah, Kevin Quire would be the best. To to, what the design, which is, is complete, which is different. Thank you, sir. Uh, could we get an update on E-rate to where it's headed? Since that's a big part of. It. Okay. Yeah. Let's do the rural health care at the same time. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. The uh, great thing about these ideas is not only are they good for our retreat, but they're also good for future uh, reports and discussion items. So what we can't do at the retreat, uh, it's good to get this feedback of things that we can talk about in uh, coming m m m m m meetings. Other ideas, things that you've been thinking about or you would like to discuss at the retreat? I imagine you are also getting input from the uh, advisory committees. They'll probably have things from their role too that we ought to think about. Okay. We probably would want to do a post-legislative review. I'd be real interested in the, you know, what's happening with higher ed and, and seeing what impact that may have on us mm -hmm. and, and the way that we can support higher ed with the changes. Okay. Something from the CIO group? Yeah, sure.
Any other ideas? What about telehealth? Um, get a report on that and how that's developing and uh, what the future plans are for telehealth. We, we have to watch this in the legislative session. I don't know if this is our mission or not. I, I think we have to really look at this, but the computer science funding uh, for computer science education that's being uh, slated for K-12 right now is significant. It, uh, it's about four times the amount of digital teaching and learning and uh, is targeted to make us an impact in the next five years on the uh, quality of computer science education K-12. So that will affect what mm -hmm. comes to the university, that will affect utilization. Uh, I think it will impact a lot of things if that goes the direction they're hoping it goes. There's also a, uh, <clears throat> a bill sponsored by Senator Ann Milner that will reorganize how the ATCs and higher education will be governed. So mm -hmm. the new board, and I'm pretty sure that will that's got, get passed. That's got good traction. And um, how that would impact what we do. Because mm -hmm. I know the ATCs do want a bigger say at the UTTC meetings in the future. So. And, I, and, and again, I think industry is putting pressure, particularly the IT industry, on the legislature. They, they need more trained people. There's lots of jobs open in IT. I've heard as high as 16,000 they can't fill. And so they're just trying to plug that gap. And any role that we could do to a line and helping that would be very good. Any questions from the staff about the meeting itself? That that the board needs to consider. I'm sure we'll have a wonderful location. We, we've appreciated the different uh, locations we've been at the last couple um, of the years. It will most likely be in Salt Lake again, so it tends to be centralized, especially if we invite people to come in and speak to, I think that would be easier. Let's just stay out of China. There may be a business meeting of the board at the end of the day if we have some action items like what Matt had mentioned or, or anything else. And then um, this is also usually the time that we start to brainstorm what the fiscal request will be for the next year, so 2022. Um, and then the last thing is this will be the first review of the budget so that you could approve it in June before the start of the new fiscal year. So some business things, basically. Okay. Well, we will take this back and begin de de developing the plan for that meeting on the 24th. If you could block out uh, the whole uh, day for that, uh, we'd appreciate it. Any other questions or anything else that needs to come up? If not, I'm well, going I, to I have one. please. Uh, <clears throat> we have a silver anniversary. Uh, Lisa King's been at the university for 25 years. So we we'll, uh, recognize her for her. Thank you. That's wonderful. Thank you very much. Well, I'm going to end our first meeting on time, and I will entertain a motion to adjourn. Good motion. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you very much. Have a good rest of your day and a good weekend. And we'll see you on April 24th. Had a great conversation with Well done. Thank you. Thank you. I hate that we're paying so